Good evening and welcome to this session. We will be continuing where we left off yesterday and also you will be able to ask your questions in the chat box which will be answered at the end. I hope all of you have seen the answers to the questions that we had raised yesterday and you can of course ask more. But please be specific with your questions so we can answer how much manure to put for a mango tree. Now, whether it is one year old or whether it's 20 years old, we don't know. How big it is, we don't know. It's difficult to give advice on that. So I would request you to be specific with your question. What exactly is the thing that you want? OK. Can we have the next slide, please? Savio? OK, so this is a session that we are continuing. Uh, what you can see in the photograph now are the plants as on today in my own little garden. You have a local custard apple, which is in the pot, and it's giving fruit. It's in a 12-inch pot. And next to it is another pot with the purple custard apples. You can see the fruits here. We have 15 fruits on this plant, which is just two years old. The other question that has been asked is, uh, do the fruits come to the same size? And here I've given you a presentation of fruits from a potted plant with a scale, so you know what the size looks like. <clears throat> so you can have fruits almost of the same quality as you would have of the plant on the ground. A question was asked, why plant in a pot when you can plant it on the ground? On the ground, you can have the plant growing big. A mango tree or a chiku tree will grow five meters in either side, and you will have 100 square meters area occupied by one tree. If you have a 300 square meter housing plot, with 120 square meter print area, then the area that you have to put plants and you would want to have 10, 15 different kinds of plants. So that would be difficult. We will look at the other plants. Next slide, please. So this is a journalist, Archidas, who grew plants in pots, and that has inspired us. There's a problem with the volume, I'll just check it out. Okay, can you hear me clear now? The uh, the volume from your side is perfectly fine. I think there is some issue with the participants' devices. They need to increase their own volumes. Okay, thank you. So, Arti grew chiku tree and breadfruit tree in 100 liter half the drum. And from there, we got the idea that we can grow fruit plants in pots. So she actually, in 2005, entering into the competition was an inspiration for me to try potted plants for various fruits. And we were able to grow them. Next slide, please. So whether it's the purple cover or whether it's star fruit that I showed you yesterday, very easy to grow in the pots. And someone asked me about mulberries. This is a mulberry stick that I put in last April into the ground. And it's already giving fruit. You can see the fruit. The fruit is from here. So it was put as a stake, not as a plant that I would want to 
nurture, but it has struck root and grown. Very easily, you can grow mulberry in a pot and have a good plant full of mulberries. Ideally, when it's about half a meter tall, prune it. So we can easily get good branches, and I'll be talking about uh, how to prune later on. So you will know how to get a good bushy plant with lots of fruit. Next slide. So strawberry is the easiest plant to grow in a pot. Fruit plant, if you want to grow, you get good fruits. Winter season, good crop. And you can get this plant in any of the nurseries in Goa. The plant nurseries on the roadside also have this plant. So it's not at all difficult. Anyone who wants to grow fruit plants, it is not rocket science. It is something that you can very easily do. OK, next slide. So yesterday, someone asked me the question, who can help them with the challenged students in Bombay? And I showed you earlier the photograph of uh, Smita Shirodkar. She's from Goa, from Shiroda, based in Dadar. And this is their website. Anyone who wants to learn about growing plants in Mumbai can contact on this website of theirs and get their contacts. Uh, Priya Kamli is the one who's looking after because Smita herself has gone to Stuttgart in Germany to do her MS <coughs> in fruit sciences. So she's out, but if there are other people who are doing it as good, very well trained, hands on. Next slide. So actually, we have looked at these points and we will just briefly run through it today. So it's reinforced in you. The selection of pots. The, many people have asked the question, what size pot to use for your lime plant? What size to use for the guava? What size to use for papaya? The pot should be of a diameter, roughly one third the height of the plant that you expect. If you want to grow papaya, you can grow in a bigger bucket, a 20 liter bucket, or you can grow it in a 500 liter drum. The important thing also is to put a weight at the bottom to balance the weight of the papaya fruit, which will be only on the top. So this is something that we need to look at. And the rest we will see. Next slide, please. So the size of the pot again, 12 to 24 inches diameter is a size of pot which is easy to handle and even if you are 50 or 60 years old you can lift the pot to shift it a bigger pot and a rcc pot or a clay pot is much difficult to handle the plastic pot has got grips <coughs> whether you use it in brown or whether you use it in the black recycled it has a grip and it becomes easier to shift you may get a conic like this or you may get it as a hollow cylinder. Both kinds of pots are good. The hollow cylinder one has got the advantage of being more balanced and steady on the ground. Next slide, please. So this is something that I learned in school from my art teacher who taught me everything. And I learned everything from him, but not how to draw, which was his main subject. And the drainage part is the important part that you look when you're potting. Those who have not noticed this part or noted it, please know that the drainage should be good. No flat tile. It should be concave, convex kind of tile. Curved side should be down so that the water flows out and the gravel may be there for better drainage. Over this, you'll be putting a layer of soil, and what soil you put, we will see in the next slide. Next slide, please. So we looked at this, the three components of soil. The sand can go below, and a mixture of all these three 
can be a pot mix. Next slide, please. So a mixture of all three is what is going to give you the loamy soil. Loamy soil basically has got some sand in it or grit, some silt and some clay. It's a mixture of all, has good drainage and has also good water holding capacity. It can hold water and give it to the plant over the next three, four days. So which is very important. Next slide. So here you can see it represented the sand, the silt and the clay. Any one of these can be replaced by adding cocoa peat and that's the soil that will go around the plant that will transplant from your bag or whatever here. And here you can see the layer of grit and gravel which is there at the base for good drainage. Now when, when you are repotting, some person had asked the question, my plant is not growing well, what to do? Then just put this pot on the side, tap it, pull out this whole ball out, and the bottom one third, you cut it off. You cut the roots also which are there in that area. If the plant is one, two years old, the roots would have come all the way down. So you cut the roots, everything, put good soil here along with compost, and then you put the plant. That is Potting on. Okay, next slide, please. So, potting, what you will see here first, after you put the crocs and the gravel, the next thing what you do is to put the soil. You put the soil up to a height which provides to put the bag inside. You will have the plant in a polythene bag which you want to put. So what you do when it's along with the bag, put it in the pot and see how it fits. The top two inches of the pot should remain clear. That is for you to water the plant without the soil falling out. So keep the two inches clear. And below that, the level of the soil in the bag should come. If the pot is not properly filled, the plant will go very deep and if you have put too much soil, the plant will pop out of the vase. Both cases you don't want. If the plant is popping out, you reduce the soil that you have put in or make a hollow in the center to take the bag. And if it goes too deep, put soil to bring it up and then place the plant in the bag again and see how it looks. Because at no point of time you want the plant to be up like one mound. It should be inside and there should be space to put water. And you don't want to dirty your floor, especially if you are growing the plant in your balcony. And balcony is tiled, you don't want all the tiles to be dirty. So make sure that you keep the level properly. And earlier we used to use a plate below to take the extra water that drains out. But now in most municipal areas, you're not allowed to put that plate below because water remains in that. Most people overwater their plants, so water remains in that and mosquitoes breed there and you have problems of malaria. And the wind spider will come after you. It will come chasing you. So best to put the proper kind of soil so that you put just enough water to wet it, not for it to drain out all over the floor. Okay, even if you have a tray, it should remain, the tray should remain dry. So, then you put the plant in. If you need to stake it, it's going to be a tall plant like this tomato plant. You put a stake and then you put the soil because the stake also will occupy space. You have to make provision for that. <clears throat> and the stake should not damage your plant, so you should put it next to the plant ball so that it is on the outside, the stake. Important whether you're putting cover plant or you put any other plant that requires support initially to remain straight, even mango plant to remain straight initially, 
it requires support, so the stake is very important. And the way we tie the plant to the stake is very important. The stake is dead wood. So you can put the rope around it and tie it as tight as you want. You can knot it hard, no problem. The plant that you're going to tie to the stake, you're not going to burn it. You are just tying it to the stake to help it to grow. So tie a very loose loop around the plant, so when it grows, it doesn't get strangulated by the rope. So in that eight, one O should be tight and the other O should be loose, so the plant can grow. What it, if it's especially a plant that grows in thickness like the mango and all, which may be as thin as your tiny finger when you plant it and then be as thick as your thumb in the question of four or five months and as thick as your wrist in a question of a year. So you have to provide for this plant to grow. So you should tie a slip knot which you can open and have a slightly longer string so that you can loosen it. <coughs> Next slide, please. So as I also told you, the important thing is when you're finally planting it, the bag has to come out. I've seen people who have done their courses in agriculture still planting with the bag in. In Mapsa, we have a rotary garden and we were redoing it and we dug up one plant and we found in the middle it's constricted. It looked like a clinical thermometer with a constriction in the middle and we were wondering why it had a constriction. And then we discovered it had an 8 inch diameter polythene bag in which it originally grew and the bag was never removed. Now this tree was 3-4 meters tall spread out. The trunk was maybe one foot in diameter and it was stuck in that eight inch diameter bag, it was constricted. So that should not happen, you have to remember to remove the bag. Next one please. So your finished product will look something like this. You have the drainage below, you have the soil which is put in, then you have put in your plant, then you have put the soil at the side, and on the top we put mulch. Now mulch is anything that breaks the continuity of the water here and the sunlight on it. So it can be gravel, it can be curry, it can be tile chips, it can be straw, it can be dried leaves, it can be plastic. Anything that breaks the continuity of the water from here to there. So when the sun shines here, this water will evaporate and then this water will come up here and that will evaporate and then watermost water will come up here and that will evaporate and the whole pot will become dry. So when you put mulch on top, the water will remain for a longer time. You have to water it less often. The plant doesn't go through fluctuation of having lots of water and no water, especially in the course of a day, between 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock, it should not go through stress. Then the plant will grow better. So this simple thing called mulch, mulch is any strata that will break the continuity of the capillary water in the soil and the sunlight which desiccates it. Okay, so this is a completed pot. Next slide, please. So for filling, normally we use a trowel. Depending on the size of the pot, bigger trowel or smaller trowel. Trowel is something that you easily see now in the graveyards. Earlier they used to give you the fauda or the kore to put the mud over the grave. Now people have become more delicate, more conscious of everything and you get trowels just to put a little bit mud over the grave. So those who don't know what a trowel looks like, anytime you go for a funeral, you know the thing that you handle to put the mud over the grave is a trowel, basically a garden tool which has now found another application. 
So the trowel, the weeding hook, this pointed thing is to pierce deep and to pull the root out along with the weed. Because if you break and take out the weeds, they tend to grow again. Weeds are very hardy. So you should water the pot, put the weeding hook, and pull out the whole weed by its roots. So that's important. These are the two kinds of cicators, and we'll see the next one. Next slide, please. So a watering can is used because it has a watering rows here, small holes in it. The water falls gently. If you go to the fields where they grow chilies and onions, you'll find people watering from the pot with their one hand below, spreading the water. So the watering can makes it very easy to do it because the watering rose <coughs> is something like your bathroom shower. It distributes the water, it falls very gently. So this is important while watering the plant so you don't water heavily, the mud doesn't spill out. Using a watering can is easiest. If it's small plants, we even recommend using a wash bottle. But using one such is very good. Okay, next. The cicada that I told you, this is the most important cicada that you should have. Everyone should have it in their home if you are doing gardening. This has got a steel plate and it has a cutting board here. It's something like your chopping board in the kitchen. And this board has a central groove into which this blade, the cutting blade, fits into it. So when you cut the plant, it cuts it clean because there's a board below and you're cutting with a sharp part of it. So that becomes very good for cutting. This kind of a cutter is called a clipper. It's good for cutting roses, flowers, uh, cutting the flower bunches which come maybe on your plant which you don't want. First year, quite often people don't want to get the fruit. But the most important thing to remember is cutting away the flowers for mango or chiku or gogo in the first year to make the plant grow is for those who are growing it in the ground. When you are growing it in the ground, you want a tree to be very tall. Whereas in a pot, you never want a tree to be tall. So enjoy your mango fruits right from the first year. You get two mangoes, enjoy them. You get five chikus or ten chikus, enjoy them. Don't remove the flowers. Don't listen to the people who tell you from standard text that you should remove the flowers in the first two, three years. Because that technology is for the plants to grow big. When they don't flower, the tree becomes huge. And when you allow it to flower and fruit, it is a natural dwarfing technique. So you want the plant to remain short. Please enjoy the fruits of gawas, mangoes, chikus, whatever you get, right from the very first year. Think it is a banana plant or think that it's a papaya plant <coughs> and enjoy it. Okay, so you don't need to clip and cut away the flowers in the first year. If it's an avocado plant, most likely it's grafted, it will give you fruits in the second year. If you are planting seedlings, except in the case of sour soap and custard apple and mulberry, normally you have to wait between five to seven years. So we prefer grafts or cuttings. If you take a small cutting of a bearing limbo tree and root it, it will give you fruits next year. If you sow a seed, it will give you fruits maybe in seven or eight years. The seedling may become big, it will also become thorny. And most of this, if you grow from seed, you don't know what kind of fruit you will get. You plant the seeds of a white guava, and there are red guavas around, and the guava you get may become pink or it may become red, it may not become white that you want. So because it's cross-pollinated. Very important that if you use vegetative propagation, cutting, layering, budding or grafting, you can get the same type of plant as 
the plant from which the stick has been taken. So very important that we should go for graft wherever possible. For things like tomato and all, you can go for seedlings, but they don't plant seeds of hybrids. They don't work. Okay, next one. Pruning is a very important process and we have to take care to prune, especially if you are growing it in a pot. You don't want the mango tree to become like a pole or the chiku tree to become like a pole or a banana plant to become like a pole. You want it to give you fruits and the horizontally growing fruits, technically we call them plagiotropes, but the technicality is not important for you. The horizontally growing branches bear more fruit and the vertically upward growing branches bear less fruit. Sometimes they don't bear fruit at all. So first thing what we do is when the plant grows at about one meter height, trim it off. In a pot, you can even afford to trim it at half a meter height. Where to cut is very important. Normally, you will get like this type of whirl of leaves. All leaves close by each other. If you cut above that, then you'll get many branches coming out there. Whereas if you cut above a single leaf somewhere, then you'll get only one shoot coming up. So cut where there's a whirl of leaves. In mango trees, you'll get it often. First, when it grows, after uh, grafting, you get one whirl of leaves. And then again, you'll get another one. So cut there, when all the leaves are closed by to each other, looks almost as if they're in a ring. And that is the place to cut. A small request, all those who have their screens on, please put off your cameras. Okay, so very important to cut. Next slide, please. So once you have cut it and you have got three or four branches, it's good to cut these branches to initiate secondary branching. So these are called primary branches. This is your main trunk. These are your primary branches. Here three are shown. You may have four, you may have five. The primary branches need to be cut, uh, normally about one foot away or two feet away from the trunk, depending on what size of pot you are using. If you're using a two foot diameter pot, then you can afford to cut it at one and a half foot, 45 centimeters to 60 centimeters. And then it will induce branching again. Next slide, please. So you'll get the secondary branches coming out. And this is how the plant will look, a mango plant. Even in a pot, it will look same. This, this is a plant in the ground, but basically showing you <coughs> the pruning technique. Give you the primary branches, one, two, and three primary branches. And then the secondary branches. Each one may have two or three secondary branches. If there are too many branches, you remove. And also, if there's any branch growing inside here, you will have to trim it off. Next slide, please. So, always we say a person with an open heart is one who is generous. So, also a tree, mango tree with an open heart is more generous. And also, a uh, rose bush, which has an open heart, is more generous. So what you will do here is all the extra branches which are there in the <coughs> middle, you will cut them away. And this kind of branches which come towards the inside, you will cut. I would suggest even cut this branch here, which is inside so that this part becomes completely open. You can see here, with all the branches, the primary branches you can see, the secondary branches are here, and the tertiary branches are sprouting out here, and this part is open. 
Now, very important here is to see that the angles are not very sharp of the plant. You could bend them by wiring. You can use the bonsai technique or you can tie a rope here and put a weight to open them up. The important thing is here in the center, it should not crack. And there should also not be any soil or water remaining here. But then sometimes it will rot over there and it will break. So potted plant, important, don't water from the top, just water straight onto the soil. Okay, don't water the plants from the top to prevent this part getting weak and rotted out. Next. So whenever you cut, it's good to apply copper oxychloride, commonly known as phytalan or bordeaux, or you get copper blue, or you can make the bordeaux paste using lime or tuna, uh, copper sulfate, mixed up and add water to them. But uh, copper sulfate, that's called blue vitriol, is a very corrosive, it cuts into your skin. So we generally don't recommend people who are not going commercially, uh, where cost is a very big factor, to use uh, Bordeaux mixture. We recommend Bordeaux mixture, of course, was the very first fungicide ever used in this world in 1885 by Milandet in France, in a place called Bordeaux, which is famous for grapes. And this is something that keeps the fungus away, keeps quite a few bacteria also away. So wherever you cut, the cut end should be painted with this Bordeaux mixture. If it's summer, just Bordeaux mixture, and, uh, sorry, phytolan or copper and water is sufficient. If you're doing it, <coughs> sorry, during the rains, then add a sticker to it. You get Fevicol DDL, not Fevicol SH, which you use for wood, but Fevicol DDL, which is used for uh, whitewashing, so that the whitewash doesn't become onto your clothes or for distemper paints. Or you get other stickers like semi short which is used in cement, or any other product, which is a sticker. Earlier we used gum arabic, but on gum arabic sometimes you have fungus growing on, so we prefer to use what we call DDL as a preferred sticker. And use a paint brush, depending on how big the cut end, maybe you need a half inch brush or a one inch brush. Two inch or three inch brushes are required only for bigger trees. So copper blue or phytolan looks this color. It's a greenish blue color. So you can use that and it's available in the market. Next. So as I also showed you this hand compression sprayer. This was normally available in big 16 liter and 10 liter sprayers. Now you can get in two one and a half liter sprayers in plastic body, easy to handle and good for you to do home gardening. So you can use this sprayer. You've got a cycle pump type of handle and a pressurizing unit inside. It pumps in air so that the liquid is forced out and the sprayer. This nozzle can be adjusted. You, it's a, a screwed in nozzle so you can unscrew it a little bit or you can screw it tight when you screw it tight it will give you very fine spray and when you unscrew it slightly it will give you a jet so you can adjust it how you want to spray when you want to clean uh, the mini bugs from the plant for example you want a jet and when you want to spray something onto it you need a fine spray so accordingly you can use it whether there's a jet or that. And this is a very good tool to keep in the house. Cost between 400 to 600 rupees. It's not a very expensive item. Anyway, and it's available all across India. All across India, you can get it. So it's not a hassle at all. You can choose your brand. Next slide, please. So actually I was talking to you about organic agriculture and when people misunderstand what organic is, that you just replace 
fertilizers with manures and your pesticide chemicals with uh, maybe herbal or microbial solution. It's not. It, it is something that uses your traditions, the local traditions, the innovations in that, and those innovations need to be validated by science. There should be multi-locational trials to see whether it really works. And if someone says, you spray this and you're okay, or you drink uh, limbo pani with a little bit of uh, ginger and honey and you won't get COVID. Now, these, these may be innovations, but they are not validated by science to say that they work. We need to have these things validated, like panchakavya is validated science. So we need validation for all, all the things that we use. <clears throat> and very important in organic farming is that we should be fair. All relationships should be fair, whether it's with human beings, with staff or labor, and whether it is with animals, insects, earthworms, anything. We should be fair to all, because this is a shared environment. Uh, we are not the king of all creation. We are part of the system that exists on this earth. So we have to be fair to all, and that's organic agriculture. And important thing is, we, it looks at tradition, what varieties you grow, how you grow, which season you grow, what is locally consumed as food. Also fruits, quite often we are fascinated with exotic fruits, which are not acclimatized here, and which may not be good. You can get watermelons in the monsoon, well, it is still summer in Delhi. But traditionally, we never ate watermelons at this time of the year. People tend to get sick with that. Uh, it, it may have excess of water, which you don't require in the monsoon. You require water in your diet in the summer, when you perspire a lot. So these things are very important that we understand organic agriculture in that context. Next. So there are a whole lot of uh, organic substances that you can use. Uh, trichoderma viride is something that I'll talk about, and trichoderma hazarinum, I'll talk about that further on. And this is a fungus which helps to control other kinds of fungus. It's something like your chor police or chor uh, or Gunda and police, a person who is a toughie can be either the law breaker or it can be the law enforcer. So this is something that uh, we look at in trichoderma. Mycorrhiza is uh, another fungus which is associated with the roots. Mycos is from fungus and rhizium is from roots. Mycorrhiza basically is fungus which is associated with the roots, which goes far away. It can help to absorb water, it can help to absorb nutrients from a place where the roots of the plants don't reach. So it also prevents disease uh, fungi, what we call pathogens, from entering it. There are fungi and bacteria which help to make the insoluble phosphorus or potash soluble. So you have this PSP, phosphate solubilizing bacteria and such things to be used. Biomonas or pseudo, this is pseudomonas, this is a Again, a bacteria which controls fungi. We'll be talking more about it. Trichoderma is normally mixed with compost, so also mycorrhiza and phosphate solubilizing bacteria are normally mix, mixed with compost or with uh, cow dung manure or anything and applied to the soil. So the compost has got carbon, which is food for it. Whereas Pseudomonas is applied as a spray on the top normally. We'll look at this in detail. Next, please. So trichoderma is a green mold. You might have seen on your bread, or you might have seen it on plants. Especially if you look at a cashew tree, you'll find this kind of mold growing on the tree. On dead wood also, you'll find green growing over there. Batovice or Bursa in Kokkari. 
this is the trichoderma which is growing on dextrose agar basically china grass in our language so it's something that can be grown it grows on a carbon source or starch source and it's multiplied this way and then made into a powder with talcum or made into a liquid formulation for us to use uh, next one please So trichoderma is this bracket fungus, mushroom you would say, bracket mushroom. So it, this is the fruiting body which will have lots of spores which will fall out which can be used for packing and used with talcum or directly as a liquid formulation to mix into compost or to mix in the soil to dip the roots of the seedling or to treat the seed. Mango seed, when you're germinating, you can apply this, or you can apply it when you're planting the graft, you can apply it with a little bit of compost to the soil. It's also for all of the plants. It prevents fungal problems coming into the plant from the soil. Wilt, for example, the sudden drying of plants is prevented from here. The rotting of roots also is prevented by using trichoderma. If you apply chemicals, you have to keep on applying chemicals every month. Whereas if you put trichoderma, all you've got to do is a little bit of compost. Uh, those who know about people who take bung, it's that way. You take bung, you become crazy, and then the effect of bung goes down, and then you eat a burfi or a dud peda. And again, it kicks you up. So this is something like that. You just add compost. No need to add more trichoderma. Trichoderma is the grain fungus. You add a little bit of compost, it will grow on it. So it's just you are giving it food to multiply and it will work. Next slide, please. So the scientists have found that farmers sometimes get confused about what to use, this to use, that to use. And now recently you must have heard about the Sputnik cocktail or Pfizer cocktail. They are trying to use all kind of cocktails which you don't drink, it's injected into you as a vaccine. So here they have made a dry cocktail which is made into a capsule which you can put into the ground. The capsule cover disintegrates and all this bacteria and fungi come into the thing, whether it's trichoderma or it's uh, pseudomonas or whatever it is to come into the ground, it will come into the ground from the capsule. So Indian Institute of Spices Research, it's a ICR body, was earlier known as National Research Center for Spices, the place where Vasco da Gama landed, Calicut, now Koi Kode. So, NCR Calicut has become into IISR Koi Kodi. So, those who don't know Malayalam will say Kozi Kodi. So, in that place, these capsules have been developed and now they are available commercially. You can get them. And a lot of products are available also in Goa or all along the coast. And these are easy to use and at 100 rupees a capsule, economical. If you don't know what to put, just take one capsule and put it into your pot. 100 rupees is your investment. Or you can dissolve the capsule into water and distribute it among four plants and make your investment at 25 rupees. All you've got to do is add a little bit of compost, which is much cheaper than adding a capsule. So you can work your own things. Next slide, please. So when you buy a mango or when you grow a mango, you don't want this kind of spots. This is anthracnose. Typical of anthracnose is <coughs> it differs from all other rods in that it gives you pock marks. The skin will have a depression. Like some people have after their pimples have burst, you get a depression on the face, the pock marks or the like the lunar landscape. These are depressions and it's called anthracnose. And the advantage of 
applying the pseudomonas comes in different ranks, biotio, or comes as spush from multiplex. All these are available in Goa from different companies. Like biotio, you can get in Margao easily. And uh, if you are coming to Pangeum or Mapsa, you will get spurs usually. The product is the same, the company is different. And it's as effective from both the companies. You can use it either in powder form. This uh, powder is the uh, same powder that you would use for your face. Or you used to use to make cocots for carnaval. So it's uh, very easy to use. If you put it in water, it will just become a little bit milky. But you, you will not see any powder left in that because it's totally colloidal and it will not get stuck in your nozzle. So it's fine, very fine, like clay. And this is the liquid form which can be used. In spurs, you get both liquid form as well as powder form you can use. And the instructions are there on that, and information is available online very easily. For spraying on mango trees at the time of flowering, or the best thing you can do is to spray now in the month of August or in the month of November when there is moisture in the air and moisture on the plant. When there is water, the bacteria will multiply. The food is there already on the leaves, so it doesn't need to be provided with any food. And you can easily grow this pseudomonas on the plant and it will control all the fungal problems which are there on the plant, including leaf spots on the plant, leaves getting dots, small holes in mango leaves that you see, collateral trichum. All those things will be controlled by just one spray of this, no need of repeat spray. And in April, May, when your mangoes are there, they will be totally free of all these problems. And you don't have to worry about spoilage. And you don't have to worry about loss. And especially if you're growing one loving mango plant in a pot at home and got 10 mangoes on it and six mangoes you don't want to have spoiled. So very easy to take care of using this solution. Next one. So this is how the bacteria actually looks. This is on potato dextrose and that, how we grow it or how we test whether it's there in a laboratory condition. It's a petri plate of glass and in that you have PDA or potato dextrose uh, This is potato that starts and this is sugar and this is your china grass to make it into a jelly like thing, all tight. And it will stick with the pin, inoculating pin or inoculating needle. And that's how it looks. This is electron microscope magnified how the bacteria looks. Shepardacar, it has a small tail. Okay, next. Insects also can be a problem, but we ha do have the ladybird beetle. This is the ladybird beetle type. You get nice, shiny looking beetle. The hind wings are silky, with which it flies. But when it's sitting on the plant, you get nice, standing plant, well, sorry, standing insect, and it can eat up to 20 aphids in a day. Aphids are those small sticky insects that you get on the underside of your brinjal leaf or on your fruit plants very easily. Anything that has beans to eat, you'll find. Anything that have depressions like guavoanol, you'll find it on that. So, this one insect can eat 20 of them, the young one of this, actually, not the adult, the young ones will eat. So it's a good insect. You get various kinds of wasps which lay eggs in caterpillars. Caterpillars like this, the wasp will lay eggs and those eggs will hatch and the insect will eat it from inside. It's something like uh, the Trojan horse in Troy. So the egg is laid inside, it grows, hatches there and the maggots eat it from inside. So it's a very good way of biocontrol. Then harmful insects, now these days if you look at the coconut trees, on the underside it's white, the leaflet, and on the upper side it is black. So this 
white fly ash it's there also in uh, things like banana and other plants papaya papaya can cover the whole fruit and the uh, leaves undersize with it many other crops even mango and all will get ash fly and very difficult to control it's good to prevent it fruit fly maggots will be talking how we use the, the trap the pheromone trap for mealybugs, these are persistent things which you have to mechanically remove pests and wash off. And for caterpillars and semi lupus, we have uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, a uh, bacteria that can be used to control it. Next one. Next slide, please. Okay, biopower you have, or you have taman, or the easiest name to remember in Bavaria Basiana is Baba. Like Baba black sheep. This Baba kills all kinds of black sheep insects. Only thing you have to be careful where you have aphids and you have uh, the ladybird beetle coming in, don't use Bavaria Basiana because it kills also the ladybird beetle. It's very effective against all kinds of beetles and weevils. Borrowed, what we say in company, borrowed or borrowed. It's very good in controlling that. And it's very good in controlling things like rhinoceros beetle in coconut. Then you have the red palm weevil in coconut, areca nut, uh, in the palmyra palm. It attacks all, the, all kinds of palms. So you can use very effectively. You can mix it with your compost or you can spray it. Preferably spraying of all these uh, microbials is done late in the evening, five o'clock onwards, so that it doesn't get immediately killed by the sunlight. It has time to spread and be dead. Okay, very effective in control. And in the soil, then it's very effective control. Uh, on the trunk of the tree, very good to control it. Okay, next one. This is the fruit fly trap I was talking about. You get a bait which mimics the mating smell of the male fruit fly. Sorry, of the female fruit fly to attract the male. So all the males will come in here thinking there is a female inside which is ready for mating. And they're actually fooled because there is only this smell is there but like teenagers in a college canteen they will not leave the place till they can find a female <clears throat> and she's not there so searching searching they die of starvation so these are very specific smells each insect even within Bactocera each of the species has got its typical mating smell and you have to use the specific one, whether it's for mango or it's for any other crop, for guava, for cashew, there are very typical smells that need to be used. Next slide, please. So this is a plastic trap with holes on the side here and here. Looks like one small drum type of thing that you get. And these insects, are the ones which died there within one week of this being hung for a tree. <coughs> Normally we'll hang it about a month before the crop is ready for harvest. But if you don't know when your mango crop is going to be ready, whether it's March or April or May, you can put it in February. You get two types of bait. One type of bait is valid for three months. So if you put it in February, then February, March, April, it takes care of your fruit flies. The other bait that's available is valid for six months. So if you put it in February, it's there with you till July. So it can cover the whole range of mangoes from Mankura, then Afus, right up to Moserat and Fernandin. Of course, Fernandin doesn't get the fruit fly problem because Fernandin has thick skin. It is like a rhino's butt, very hard, very difficult to pierce. So the ovipositors become like pins being driven into wood. They break. 
So the insects don't go to lay eggs in the Fernandin mango. It's very tough. But all other mangoes, especially Pizario and Moserat, will get very easily. And no need to spray. Just put one and it will protect your plants. And if you're growing them in pots, then even if you have got uh, 50 potted mango, one trap is enough. Okay, it may take care of your neighbor's fruit trees also. Next one, please. So again, in this uh, collaborative learning cafe and in all the things I do, whether it's with the Brito's Old Boys Association or with the Botanical Society of Goa or now with the Agricultural Alumni Association, this is what works for me and works for the people who are there in the group. And if we all collaborate, then we learn more. As I've said earlier, Aki was a participant in the garden competition. We had gone to judge, but we have learned a new thing there. And even with my students, when they do their presentations on Sundays, we have put a link there. It's something that we learn a lot when we interact. So that's it for today. Thank you. Can we have the next slide? So those of you who want to contact can email me here. WhatsApp and phone calls may become difficult because unfortunately as I grow older, more people keep calling me and I cannot handle too much. But email is something definitely I can reply. Or please get to me on to Facebook. Uh, not good to come on to my Facebook as a friendship, but if you come to Botanical Society of Goa, then all that deals with plants is there. So Botanical Society of Goa on Facebook is a good group to join if you want to interact. Savio will take the questions. Yeah, sure, we can have it now. Um, you can see the questions in the chat box and like yeah. a few of them have been answered. Very few of them have been answered. So uh, there are books on plants, on biodiversity, the, uh, the trees of Panjim, which is there. There is the growing vegetables organically, which you can also link up. So what are the advantages of planting trees in pots? The basic advantage is about saving space and being in control of the plant, which is in, in a your, uh, front garden, backyard, uh, terrace somewhere. The other thing is if you are staying in a building, you don't have the opportunity to plant anything on, on the ground because the ground is not yours. So that's the biggest thing. Fruiting earlier and all doesn't take place. It will fruit as per the plant habit. The graft on the ground or the graft in the pot will bear at the same time. Okay. How to soften hard rocky soil? I think the best thing to do is if you're digging a pit and you hit rock then you put soil sorry put salt rock salt onto it and cover it with leaves or with coconut husk and tip it for some time add water the salt will eat into the rock if you want to try an experiment you can put a, a little bit of salt in a mud pot and keep it on a chira on a stone and you'll find it so it's eaten off completely. <clears throat> so salt is a very good dispersion agent. It will break the rock. Let's uh, hope it. Now, if you've got rock right on the surface, then there is no way to soften it because the, the salt will remain on the surface. But if you have a little bit of soil, then below that, you can dig and put the salt and soften it. Will we get fruit if you plant 
the plant is grown from seed in a pot. Now it depends if the if the seed of is of sour soap, in two years' time you will get fruit from the seedling. But in most, it is good to put a graft. Where in North Korea do we get good garden soil used in pots? Uh, you can uh, buy it off from the nurseries on the roadside, or if you want to prepare mix, then uh, Mr. Farmer and Green Essentials. Green Essentials is near Sukur Church. They have uh, cocoa soil, cocoa mix, and they have got all the ingredients separately. You can buy cow dung, dried cow dung, or goat's pellets, or anything. <coughs> if you want to improve your soil, because Garden soil is basically a thing to give anchorage and to give the nutrients to the plant. Anchorage can be given by any soil. So what you need to add to the soil you have is the nutrients. So manures and cocoa pit is what I would suggest. Replacing the soil is an expensive and unnecessary process. If you can add a cocoa pit, uh, compost to it, or goat manure, good enough no need to replace the soil. But if you don't have soil, like you're in an apartment block, or it's rocky land in Porvori or somewhere, you're on a plateau, then only buy soil. But if you have anything that's soft, then the roots can penetrate, just improve its quality. See, let me know how to grow neem from branches or seed. You can grow it from the seed, uh, Mediterranean area, you should be able to grow it. But it's uh, pretty warm over there. If you are growing it in a pot, you can take it indoors if by chance your winter is extreme. Trees don't grow below 10 degrees centigrade or Celsius. So if your temperature drops below that for a long time, you can take it indoors and you are uh, keeping your indoors temperature at 16, 18, 19, 22 whatever degrees Celsius, you, if you can take it indoors, you can do it. And for light, you can use a LED bulb. If your room is normally well lit, no need to do anything. Little nut trees are about 10 years old, but they're just three or four meters tall and do not yield. Uh, the main reason may be that you, your nutrition. You need to add uh, organic manure to it. You also need to give it a high dose of potash and phosphorus for growth. So if it's not growing, 10 years and 3-4 meters, it's not growing. So water, nutrition, two things you'll have to look at. What about avocados? Avocados from soil is a patient's game. Seven years, maybe if you're lucky, five years. I would suggest you go for a graph because in today's world, most of us are in a hurry. So from, from seedling, you're going to take a long time. Should we prune papaya trees too? Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, papayas, uh, plants normally are of three types. One is male, one is female, and one is gynodioecious. The gynodioecious has uh, female flowers and it has hermaphrodite flowers. Now, hermaphrodite in human beings, you would have said it's a chakka. But hermaphrodite in plants is known as perfect. It's called a perfect flower. Male and female together is called perfect. So it's uh, interesting. So if there are more number of perfect flowers, then you get fruit for sure. And they will help to pollinate also the female flowers which are there on the plant. So gynodiaceous varieties like Kur honeydew or honeydew are very good. You have got dioecious plants like uh, Taiwan 786, where you have a male and female plant separate. There you need to have one male plant for every 10 female plants. And there are other varieties which have female plants and gynodioecious plants. In this case, you don't have to worry if you have got more than one plant. 
But if you have only a female plant, then you may need to hand pollinate if there's no other papaya plant close by. And the funny thing is if you have a male plant and cut it, sometimes there is sex reversion, it will become into a female or a gynodiocese plant. Same thing can also happen if you cut a female plant, it can turn male. So pruning is not normally recommended except in those papaya varieties with naturally branch. The local papaya variety, Lamodi, what we call, uh, with yellow pulp inside. Normally branches, you can cut it, it will branch. But uh, the other varieties, uh, ideally, don't cut because you don't want to end up with lots of male plants. If you have male plants, cut them. Alvito, can you please stop uh, presenting? Alvito D'Souza. Okay, thank you. How can we treat fungal spots on the bark of the lemon tree? If you spray sparse or any other pseudomonas, good enough. You can of course use the fungicide, uh, bavistin or carbendazine, that's good to be used. Yeah, instead of Bordeaux, what we have in Goa is uh, phytolan uh, and copper blue. It's copper oxychloride. You can uh, take it in any brand. It's good enough. Copper oxychloride instead of copper sulfate. Works very good, non-corrosive. Uh, one very important thing, when you use any copper compound, uh, please see that it's not there on sprayed when there is fruit. Sprayed before fruiting. If you spray it after fruiting, see that you wash it properly. And please wash your hands with soap after spraying. Because copper, if it lands in your intestines, it will stop absorbing vitamin B complex. So, and it's not going to get flushed out ever. Only when you go either to the mushroom bumi or to the grave, that's the time the copper will come out. So, please, if you're using copper compound, please make sure you wash your hands well. And also if your labor or somebody is handling, please tell them. Whether it's Bordeaux mixture or copper oxychloride, please wash up clean before touching any food. Indophil M45, that's a mencozap, you can always use to control fungus. Uh, it's not allowed in organic farming, but uh, Definitely, you can use to control fungi in some border region. If the land is left fallow, then normally weeds grow. It, doesn't degrade in terms of uh, its nutrient capacity because weeds grow, weeds die in the same place and they regenerate all the nutrients which are there. And especially if you have uh, weeds like uh, touch me not, lazuli, it will actually enrich your soil with nitrogen because it's a nitrogen fixing legume plant. Moringa grows very easily from branches, that's your drumstick. Very easily, you take a branch about as thick as your wrist, uh, make a cutting of about one meter height, and plant it. Make sure water doesn't stagnate there, but it's a very soft plant and it will root and sprout. Neem, I have not had good success in Goa, <coughs> though neem grows from branches. Yeah. If you have a, a bracket mushroom that is uh, of trichoderma, then you can use. You can just get it identified with somebody. If it's trichoderma, you can use it. If there are other bracket fungi like uh, ganoderma, which is used in human medicine, but very dangerous with plants. So identification of mushroom is important. There is a beautiful 
saying in the dictionary of the improbable by Art Linkletters, if you ate a toadstool and didn't die, it must have been a mushroom. A mushroom is a, a, a tricky subject. Uh, not all mushrooms are good, uh, whether it's a bracket mushroom or whether it's a mushroom that looks very much like our traditional edible mushroom. It's good to know which one it is and identify. How to grow lemon from a branch? The best method to do it is a booty. You take a branch about as thick as your tiny finger or a pencil, uh, cut a one inch section between two leaves, a whole circle round, remove the ring. About one inch wide is enough. Uh, apply soil, cocoa peat, uh, coconut uh, fiber, anything now, and tie it with a rope. No need to use plastic. Within one month, the roots will emerge. Then, once the roots emerge, you make a cut in the branch below what you have tied, towards the roots of the plant. Make a cut about uh, half the thickness of the branch. And after 15 days, cut it off and take it and plant it in a vase or in a polythene bag with soil. Let the roots adjust from being water roots to become soil roots. <clears throat> and then after 15 days, you can plant it wherever you want. You can also make cuttings out of uh, lime. Remove, cut away the leaves with the cicada or with the scissor. Leave the petioles there itself and plant it correctly. In the sense that that part which is closer to the root should go into the ground and the part which is closer to the tip should remain above. It should root you uh, maybe 50 to 70 percent if you are doing it now in June. If you put 10 between 5 and 7 plants will root. You can also use a rooting hormone which is available, naphthalene acetic acid. Name is either quick root or serenix or caradix or rutex. Any, any of these names is the same thing inside different companies. So you can use that. To use, just dip the bottom half inch of it in water, take it out, shake and dip it in this powder. It's talcum powder with the hormone in it. Keep it for five minutes and then plant. For planting, take a stick or a poker, make a hole in the soil and put it. The bark of the stem should not peel off and your powder should not come off when you're pushing it into the soil. So just make a hole and put that in. A potato getting black heart is a common to fungal disease. You can cut it out and eat the rest, but you don't boil it as such. Good to cut it and put it if you think it's a little bit thick. Sometimes it will be a little bit green, the patches. The green patches because it was immature. But black heart is a fungal problem. Uh, so we are already, uh, I mean, yeah, we reached yeah, the yeah. time. Yeah. So uh, would you like to like answer the questions again in PDF? We can do that and you can post it tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'll just demonstrate uh, everybody how to access the PDF uh, or, or the PPTs which were presented today and yesterday. Uh, sorry, uh, even with the answers of yesterday. Um, just one second. So this is the website of collaborative learning. Okay. And uh, you'll need to go to the resources and then notes and videos. Here you'll find this uh, banner of uh, Mengelsa. Click on it. And then a page will pop up. You can, If you want to continue uh, learning of uh, regarding organic gardening and agriculture or food processing, you can join the Facebook group by clicking here. here there's a button provided which will take you to the Facebook uh, group as well. The PPTs of yesterday and of today are uploaded here. Uh, the answers of yesterday's questions in a PDF format is uploaded. Uh, yesterday's video, uh, I mean, um, 
the lecture is recorded and it is uploaded on YouTube as well as on this website. You all can find it here. And today's session will be uploaded here. Uh, now that we have many questions for the second session also, I'll try to uh, upload the um, answers whenever sir will uh, provide it to me. That will be placed mostly here. So you will need to visit the website that is collaborativelearningcafe.org and uh, go to resources, notes and videos, select Mingles as banner and then you will land here for all the resources. Uh, we have uh, with us um, Mary Ann, who would like to speak a few words. Over to you, Mary. Hi, good evening. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for those wonderful talks yesterday and today. We thoroughly enjoyed it, all of us plant lovers and gardeners, I'm speaking from Bangalore. I think people from all over the world have uh, tuned in. Thank you so much for all that information. Uh, the Collaborative Learning Cafe started as a small idea. In about two months, it has taken root. Thanks so much to everyone who made it happen. That's all of us together who have been uh, online today and yesterday. To speakers, like Professor Miguel uh, Braganza, every uh, one of you in this very engaged audience, Father Provincial Roland Coelho, SJ, for his persistent encouragement, and all our volunteers. Please visit our website at collaborativelearningcafe.org or on Facebook to learn more about our upcoming programs. Suggest what you'd like to have as programs and offer to conduct ones that take ahead any form of job training, lifelong learning, and hobby courses. Volunteers are always welcome. We have an interesting set of environment-related talks coming up. So thank you so very much for this evening and for yesterday. It has been a very educative experience for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Good night. Thank you.